Welcome to part two of the walkthrough of the schematic for the ZX Spectrum with no ULA. If you haven't already watched it, I suggest you watch part one of the series, which I've linked below. There, I went over the circuit for the Z80 microprocessor and its interface to the memory system. After that, I went over the raster generator, which is made from a large EEPROM wired up as a finite state machine. This is the gross architecture for the machine, but there are still quite a few details I need to go over. One thing that was pointed out in the comments was the ordering of the output pins on the 27C322 EEPROM. Here, we can see the outputs of the EEPROM are labelled Q0, Q8, Q1, Q9 and so forth, but the bus connected is labelled sequentially video data 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. So what gives? Well, it's actually an important point, but I believe that it's your ability to debug that determines what you can build rather than your soldering skills or coding skills. So, for a prototype like this, or even when I worked on GPUs at NVIDIA, I was always thinking about how I'm going to debug the machine during the design phase. In software, I can rearrange the bits of the EEPROM so that we can set the outputs to be sequential, Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3, etc. I have a routine called shuffle data, which rearranges the bits to do this. Why? Well, during debug, when I'm single-stepping the clock, I can go around the chip with a logic probe and translate the pattern into hexadecimal in my head. But I can only do this if the outputs are sequential. I did try keeping the Q0, Q8, Q19 pattern at first, but I found it harder to debug, and I made many simple errors. Obviously, I'd prefer a circuit that works first time, but that's not always realistic. And there is some thrill in the chase during debug, but you've got to give yourself all the advantages you can. All right, back to the design. The next part of the circuit I want to look at is video out. For every eight screen pixels, we need to do two memory reads, one for the actual pixel data and one for the attribute data. Here's the timing I use for the two reads. I read the bitmap first, but we can see from the shift register load signal that the data isn't loaded into the shift register until the end of the second read. What this means is that we need to store this pixel data temporarily between the bitmap read and the shift register load. I can do this with an extra octal D type flip flop between the data buff and the 74HC166 shift register, so that's what this part of the circuit does. The attribute data is different. At the end of the attribute read, we can store this data in another octal D type flip flop. The attribute data is used immediately after it's latched into these flip flops, so we don't need any other circuitry beyond this 74HC374. How do we get from here to the final RGB signal that goes to the video port? OK, so I have 8 pixels loaded into the shift register at 1 bit per pixel, and I have the attribute register, which contains 3 bits for the paper colour and 3 bits for the ink colour. These correspond to the background colour and foreground colour in the active area respectively. I have this brightness signal, which I do need, but I won't worry about flash for now. In the active area, I want to select between the paper colour and the ink colour based on the current output of the shift register. Now, I could use a 2 to 1 multiplexer, but I also need to worry about border colour as well at some point, so I'm going to use a 4 to 1 multiplexer per colour using the 748C253. This chip has two multiplexers per chip, and based on the select inputs, each multiplexer selects one of the four inputs to present at the output. Let's trace through one of the colour components by itself. One of the select inputs is connected to the output of the shift register, and the other is connected to a border signal, which we'll discuss a bit later. But it's high when it's outside the active area. In this case, input 0 is connected to the blue paper attribute bit, input 1 is connected to the blue ink attribute bit, and inputs 2 and 3 are connected to the blue border bit. Again, I'll come back to this later. In the active area, the border signal is low. If the shift register outputs are 0, we select the paper bit. If the shift register output is 1, we select the ink bit. And if border goes high, it doesn't matter what the output of the shift register is, we select the border colour bit. We can see the path for the blue bit wide in here. We repeat the circuit for the red and green colour channels. Now, the brightness bit's a little different. We want the brightness bit to apply to both the paper and the ink, but we don't want brightness to apply to the background. 
So, we use a fourth multiplexer to transmit the brightness bit through in the active area, and we make sure it's zero in the border area. Now we have four bits, which are red, green, blue, and intensity, and we need to convert this into six bits with two bits per pixel. We pass through red, green, and blue directly to generate three of the bits, and we and each of red, green, and blue with intensity, which generates another three bits, or an intensity bit per color. I've added in another octal D-type flip-flop with a resettable output, the 74HC174, because I want the signal to be blank during sync. When blank bars low, all of the six bits will be zero. In the end, blank bars low during the sync signals, but it actually covers a little more screen area, which I'll also go over in a moment. Finally, we have this simple R2R ladder, which we use to generate the final signal for each color before it goes to the VGA port. To understand how the sync signals are generated, you need to look at the code in the EEPROM. This is a visual representation of the raster generated state space. It's 64 columns across and 525 rows going down. The red region is the active display, black areas are the horizontal and vertical sync signals, green is the horizontal border region, blue is the vertical border. These have gone over before, but there are two more regions we need to look at. This cyan region near the V-Sync signal is the CPU interrupt signal, which is used to update the keyboard and system clock. Finally, we have these yellow stripes either side of H-Sync. I call these the H-Sync guard signals, and basically they blank out the RGB signal going to the VGA monitor slightly before V-Sync until slightly after V-Sync. Without these, my monitor had difficulty displaying color consistently. I have two versions of the code to make this raster generator EEPROM on GitHub. One just generates the bit file, while the other generates this display, which we can use to check to see that it works the way we expect it to. We'll go over the code in the simpler version of this file, but both are available. You can load videofsa.zip from the GitHub repository, unzip it, open it up in Visual Studio 22, which is free, then you'll need to open up the video FSA file itself, compile and run it, and it'll save a file called videofsa.bin, which is the EEPROM image. All right, to start with, we have a set of constants which are based on the VGA standard. We have a 14.318 MHz pixel clock, which we divided by 31.5 kHz each sync frequency, then divided by 8 pixels per byte, gives us 56.8 columns per scan line, which we can round up to 57. For 256 active pixels, we need 32 byte addresses. The H-Sync signal is 12% of the scan line, so 12% of 57 is 6.8 bytes wide, so we can round it up to 7. H-Sync start is positioned to put the H-Sync signal in the middle of the horizontal border. Standard VGA has 525 scan lines, and we need to scale up native 192 lines to the ZX spectrum by a factor of 2, so the number of scan lines in the active region is 384. VSync itself is two scan lines high, and again I position it in the middle of the vertical border. Now I need to define the state space, which I also call the address space. Even scan lines in the active area start at 0 hex, odd scan lines start at 2000 hex. The horizontal border starts at 4000 hex, vertical border at 8000 hex, and the sync region starts at C1000 hex. Within sync, the region between C800 and CFFF hex is for interrupt. Bit 12 is for H sync, and bit 13 is for V sync. So, when we look at the schematic, we detect when we're in the sync region with this AND gate, U2B. We then AND the sync region signal with bit 12 to generate each sync, bit 13 to generate vsync. We invert the sync region signal to generate our blank bar signal. Now, this is a bit messy, but I was running out of space when I built this, so I had to try and generate the CPU interrupt signal with just one chip. This chain of NAND gates essentially detects when the upper five bits of the state address are 11001, which corresponds to the address range C800 to CFFS. All right, now let's look at the code. First, we clear the entire EEPROM, so no matter where it lands at reset, it'll go back to the start of the frame. Next, for every column, 
Then every row in the column, we can print the address the EEPROM for any given combination of row and column, as well as the address of the byte immediately to the right of it, that is, column plus one. Inside the computer address routine, first we check if we're at the end of a scan line. If so, we roll over to the next scan line. Then, once we're at the bottom right, we wrap around to the top left. Next, we figure out if we're in the active area. If so, we strip off the bottom bit from row, multiply it by the horizontal total, and add in the column number. This converts the 2D row and address coordinates into a single linear address range. Next, we examine the bottom bit of row and decide whether it goes into the odd address or even address range within the state space. We do this so that the bottom 10 bits of the state address remain the same for two scan lines in a row, which is how we scale up from 192 to 384 scan lines. Before we return, we need to swap some of the bits so it matches the spectrum's bit ordering. Next is interrupt generation. We know the ULA in this spectrum asserts interrupt once per frame. My understanding is that it does this at the start of vSync and it's asserted for 30 CPU T states. Now, I know some games are very sensitive to the timing of the interrupt signal, and they may not work properly on this machine. Anyway, I decided to put the interrupt a little earlier so it's easier to implement. Also, to compensate for the fact that we're updating at 60Hz in VGA instead of 50Hz in PAL, which will make the horizontal borders shorter in this machine compared to the regular ZX Spectrum. The interrupt signal is asserted on the scan line before vSync for 15 finite state machine clocks, which is the equivalent of 30 CPU T states. Next, we figure out if we're in HSync or vSync. If so, we set the base address to sync address. If we're in HSync, we convert the row and column into a 1D address and add in the HSync bit. If we're not in HSync but in vSync, we do the same but add in the vSync bit. But what happens when both HSync and vSync are active? Well, we deal with this in the HSync code, and we just add in the vSync bit. You can single step through this code if it doesn't make much sense. The next problem I had was that the color signals were active right up to the edge of HSync. To deal with this, I wanted to put a blank column in before and after HSync, so I moved these two columns into the C1000 address range, which means blank bar will be asserted, and the monitor will get a short blank signal before and after HSync. Finally, we check to see if we're in the horizontal border or vertical border regions. Alright, we need to generate the border signal that the multiplexers use. We know the display is active between 0 and 3 FFF. So, VA14 and VA15 should both be low when the display is active. We can detect this with an OR gate. Now, this will go low when we fetch the first bit pattern and attribute from memory, but we want the border to cover this first pair of fetches, and we can do that with another D-type flip-flop, which will delay the signal by half CPU clock. Alright, we're nearly done, we just need to go over the I.O. system. I'm using a 74HC138328 decoder. It's enabled by the I.O. rec signal from the CPU, and we break out all the combinations of A0, read bar, and write bar. When the Z80 CPU does a port write to an even address, IO rec bar, write bar, and A0 will all be low, while RD bar will be high. This asserts output 2. This in turn latches data into this octal D type flip flop, which is then used to set the border red, green, and blue signals. I haven't connected them up yet. This is where I'd connect the speaker and microphone port. Conversely, a read from an even port will force IRQ bar, read bar, and A0 to be low, while write bar will be high, and this will assert output 4 from the 138. This enables the 74HC245 to transfer the keyboard data back to the data bus. The signals driving the keyboard during the port read come from the upper address line bits. This is the same in the actual spectrum, as well as the ZX80 and ZX81. I hope you've enjoyed this series. I know some people will have a much better handle on the design now that they have a schematic available. In the next series, which will be a bit further down the track, I'm going to try and replace the ULA and Z80 with TTL logic, EEPROMs, and static RAM. This series is a bit more hardcore, and I'll use a random access Turing machine in place of the Z80. But if you really want to understand how these 8 bit machines work at the most fundamental level, keep an eye out. As always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.